Good morning, Northwest Chapel. I'm Pastor John Pappas. We thank you for joining us online this morning. Today will be a little bit different from our normal time together, but a very important Sunday service. Today we'll be hearing from Officer Ken Lawson. Ken will be speaking on the issues of human trafficking, so it will be a message that's for a more mature audience and may be a trigger for some. Obviously, the choice to view his presentation is yours, but if you have young children and are concerned that they may not be ready for this material, we want to give you the option to allow them to step out when the time comes. But before we welcome Officer Lawson, let's worship together. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we want to thank you for this opportunity to worship together. We're aware of the fact that it's extraordinarily special to be able to have this time to exalt your holy name. We thank you for your love for us that's unconditional, and we want to remember the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ today, that he lived, died, and rose again, and that's a message we want to proclaim to the world. And Lord, part of being in the world is being aware of the sin in the world. And trafficking has become such a major problem, not just in the world, not just in our country, but right here in Columbus, Ohio. So help us to be sensitive to that today, Lord. We're so thankful for Officer Ken Lawson and him coming and speaking with us today. And just please help us to be more prepared, uh, to have more understanding on this topic, and to know how we can be more part of the solution as we want to reach others for the name of Jesus Christ. We want to thank you now for this opportunity to quiet our minds, to quiet our hearts, to put aside the distractions, and to give our hearts fully to you in worship. We love you and we glorify your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Northwest Chapel. Thank you so much for joining us online. We have a new song for you today. It's called, There's Nothing That Our God Can't Do. And I feel that it is a perfect song for this time. Um, just things have been stressful. Things have been anxiety inducing. And it's really good for us to sing the truth that there is nothing that our God can't do. Regardless of whatever happens in the future, he can handle it. There's nothing too big for him. And we can believe in a greater hope that's Jesus Christ, the hope of our salvation. He's coming back. He will be with us, and we will spend eternity with him. So would you join us this morning as we sing together?
As I mentioned at the top of our service, we are joined today by local police officer Ken Lawson to discuss human trafficking. This is such an important message because trafficking isn't just something that happens other places, but it takes place right here at home. The city of Columbus and the state of Ohio have become a hub for human trafficking. With our multiple interstate systems and several large events each year, Ohio is the nation's fourth leader in reports of human trafficking. Just last week, 45 children were rescued while hundreds were arrested during an anti-human trafficking sting right here in Ohio. So, as a church family, we not only want to be informed, but we also want to seek God on how he wants us to engage this issue, that we may bring his love and light to this sinful world. We are truly blessed to have Officer Lawson with us here today as he has been on the ground floor of Ohio's anti-human trafficking efforts. As an area police officer, Ken has earned the Ohio Attorney General's Distinguished Law Enforcement Service Award for his work in bringing awareness of this critical issue, lobbying for legislation, and training and mobilizing the community in anti-trafficking efforts. So much of his work has taken place outside of his regular duties with the, the police department. Officer Lawson has held over 300 training opportunities for fellow officers, foster children, educators, caseworkers, and more. And today we have the privilege of hearing from him. Please joining me in welcoming Officer Ken Lawson. As Pastor John said, I'm Ken Lawson and it's a privilege to be here with you at Northwest Chapel. Um, I wanted to talk about human trafficking today and also uh, in the process of doing that, explain to you a little bit about how God's worked in my life through this. Um, when I was new on my department, um, I was driving down the freeway one night and I was going uh, you know, 65, 70 miles an hour and I'm coming up and I see two small white lights coming at me and it's on my side of the road and they're not headlights and I realized as I was getting closer, these are backup lights, which you're not supposed to be see on the freeway. 
And so as I got closer, I realized this person is backing up the freeway. So I pulled up behind him in a cruiser. I turned the lights on and everything's flashing. And this lady turns around and starts waving her arm at me like she wants me to get out of the way. And I'm thinking, I'm not moving. So I'm motioning her to the side of the road. She's motioning me out of the way. And finally, my motions beat hers and she pulled to the side of the road. So I went up and I talked to her and I said, you know, you can't back up the freeway. Now, she was not from Ohio, but I've been to West Virginia and they're not allowed to do it there either. So I said, you can't back up the freeway here. And she said, I'm just trying to go right there. And she was going to back up the freeway down an entrance ramp and then go over to a motel that she had driven past. And I said, you can't do that. And so we talked for a minute and I said, just go up to the next exit, turn around and then get back on the other side and come back. You'll be right here. She said, I can't do that. I said, no, really, you can do this. I said, you just go to the next exit, turn around, make a flip and get back on and come back here. She goes, no, I'll get lost. And I'm doing my best imitation of a motivational coach, believing that this person I just met can accomplish what I'm saying. And I said, you can do this. Just get off at the next, that next exit and turn around. You can do this. I know you can. And she goes, no, I'm going to get lost. I can't do it. Can I just back up the freeway? I said, there's no way we can do that. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll drive up there. You follow me and I'll get you back here. She goes, you want me to follow you? I said, yeah, follow me. So we pull out, I start down the freeway, and it's not 10 seconds, and I hear an officer come on the radio, and he said he's chasing a car, four people on it, the car's stolen, and he's going down the freeway. So I just turn my lights off on, and I take off. So I'm getting on another freeway, I'm up to about 120 miles an hour, I'm getting off at an exit, I'm doing 90 on a side street, trying to get up to where this officer's outnumbered with this stolen car. We pull into a public housing project, He's got the car pulled over. We go running up at gunpoint, get all four people out, get them on the ground, get them handcuffed, get them put in different cruisers. We talked for a few minutes about what happened. And I said, do you need anything else? He goes, no, I'm good. And I turn around to walk back to my cruiser and I see this lady sitting behind my car on the hood of her car. And she has a grin the size of the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland. And I said, what are you doing here? She goes, that was great. I said, what are you doing here? She goes, you said to follow you. And she did. 120 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour on the side streets, all the way up to gunpoint arrest. She stayed right with me. So I said, okay, let me get you where you need to go. So we get in our cars, we pull out. It's not 10 seconds. And I hear the dispatcher say, state highway patrols chasing a car 90 miles an hour through the city. They're going down this street. So I turn the lights on again and I take off. And I look back in the rearview mirror and she is right on my bumper, grinning the whole time, driving, just leaning forward. And we get up to the street where I'm gonna go right, she needs to go left, so I roll the window down, point her this way, and she waves at me and smiles and makes her left turn and hopefully found where she was going to. <laughs> I said, follow me, and she did. No matter what I put her through, 120 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour, gunpoint arrest in a public housing project, she did exactly what I said, those two simple words, follow me. We all get that in life. At some point, Jesus is gonna say, follow me. As a matter of fact, he said it many times in the New Testament. Matthew records it six times. Mark records it four times. Luke and John both five times. And every single time it's attributed to Jesus. And the times that he uses it, he calls people that he just met into relationship. Remember Peter? Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Peter heard it at the very beginning of his relationship with Jesus. He did it to challenge people who had reservations about the cost of discipleship. He told people, you know, go, go sell all your stuff and then come follow me. If that's, your, if that's what's holding you back, go sell it, then come follow me. He said it to challenge followers about the cost of discipleship. He said, if you, want to, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and what? Follow me. He said his sheep would do this. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they will follow me. And Peter heard this all the way through the public ministry of Jesus. They were the first words he said to him. He heard it all the way through the public ministry of Jesus. And then when Peter gets almost to the end of his time with Jesus here on earth, Jesus is talking to him. He's made breakfast. He's given him the feed my sheep. Do you love me? 
And he says, Peter, when you're older, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. He's giving him a warning that his death is going to be unpleasant. But then he said, follow me. John asks Jesus a question. Peter looks at John and he's like, hey, I wonder what he's got to go through. And he said, what about him? And Jesus said, if I want him to remain until I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus says this to his disciples throughout the New Testament. And eventually, in our walk with him, it comes to us. There was a point in my life where I wasn't really looking for it, but it came. And it's easy to understand, follow me, just like the lady in the car. No matter what I did, she stayed with me. But there are things that get in the way that, that keep us from doing it. Sometimes it's the demands of life. I get so busy with what I'm doing, children, marriage, work, church, activities, hobbies, whatever they are, they can crowd out that follow me mandate that we get. They can be distractions, things that I'm, I'm following with Jesus, but all of a sudden this thing looks really good and I get distracted from what I was doing. It can be the destination. I'll follow you like Jonah. I'll follow you, but not there. <laughs> or it could be disappointment. You know what? I was following you, but man, this went somewhere that I didn't, I don't like what I'm experiencing. And I don't, I don't want to do this. Or it could just simply be discernment. I thought this was what you wanted me to do, but it looks like it's this. There's things that get in the way, but the command's really clear. Follow me. And so in a discerning heart, we try to figure out, what am I supposed to do with this? Where am I supposed to go? For me, I got an email at work one night. I had never met this person. She was the director of a, a Washington, D.C. women's public policy research group. And she was networking for people at Health and Human Services. And I get an email saying, do you know how to recognize a trafficked person? I was in a small group with her sister. I think she got my email address from her. I had never met this person, had no idea why she's emailing me, and I had never heard of a trafficked person. So I emailed her back, I said, what is it? And over the course of the next year, she educated me on what this looked like. She was sending me news articles about cases that surfaced around the world, cases that were starting to surface in the United States, and I'm reading them, and a lot of what I read overlapped with what I investigated, but I had never heard of this term. So after reading on it for about a year, I saw that the Department of Justice was holding its first human trafficking conference in the United States, and they recommended that states pass a human trafficking law. Only four states in the country had one at the time. So I called my state representative and said, as a constituent, has anyone introduced this? She said, no, I'd be glad to, but I need some help. I said, I don't know enough about it to help you, and I haven't met anyone who does know something about it. And it kind of stopped there for a while. And the more that I learned about this, People, people asked, one group asked me to come speak to them for 45 minutes. I put a presentation together. I felt like I'd run a marathon. I exhausted everything I knew about this in 45 minutes. And then I got a call from a group that said, can you come teach us for three hours? So I did more research and I tried to put together a three hour presentation. Then I had another group that called and said, can you come teach us for six hours? And so I just kept accumulating knowledge on this and people were saying, can you come talk to us? And it just kind of mushroomed into um, being active in this arena. And what I had, what it appeared to me was that God had dropped it in my lap. I didn't see anyone else I knew who was working on it. What was happening to these victims was tragic. And I just felt like God was saying, I want you to do something about this. And so I tried to figure out how can I help? And it just kept going. And it was literally like Jesus was saying, follow me. And I tried to be like that lady at 120 miles an hour on the freeway, just don't lose sight of him. <laughs> so what I learned was the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, it became the foundation for everything we do legislatively on this topic now. It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for duly convicted crime, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So in 1865, when we got this amendment, 
the only entity following that that was allowed to hold someone in a state of involuntary servitude was the government. And aside from that, no one else can. And you can't consent to being in this type of relationship with someone. No one is allowed to hold someone in this country in a state of involuntary servitude. And so we call this modern day slavery because it's occurring today even though we banned it with the constitutional amendment back in 1865. And basically, here's the simple definition that I, I train children's services caseworkers throughout Ohio. And I try to give them a short, concise definition that they can take anywhere with them, remember it, and utilize it. Victims of human trafficking are exploited for two things. The first is commercial sexual activity. Now, it takes on a number of forms. Prostitution makes perfect sense. So does stripping, so does pornography, so do peep shows, so do massage parlors. All of those qualify, but it goes outside of that. It's the exchange of something of value for the sexual activity. And when I talk to children's services caseworkers, we talk about runaways. A runaway needs two things, food and shelter. And if they're trading that for sex, that's a commercial relationship and it qualifies. There was a stepmom down in Athens who was arrested out of a case. She had a 16 year old stepdaughter. The stepmom liked to do drugs. She just didn't like to pay for them. So she would take her 16 year old stepdaughter to a 68 year old registered sex offender who would give her drugs in exchange. It's a commercial relationship. That girl's a trafficking victim and the mom is a trafficker. There's also a case out of Kentucky where mom and dad went to a car dealership and they told the guy, we want that car right there. We'll bring our 16 year old daughter once a month in exchange for the car. It's a commercial relationship where sexual activity is exchanged. And all of this qualifies, even though it's outside of that box we normally think of, it all qualifies. The second thing that victims are exploited for is labor. And we'll talk in a few minutes about a number of areas in the country where we have found victims exploited for labor. And traffickers use three things to accomplish this. The first is force. We all understand it. You hit someone, slap someone, beat someone. It's a tremendous motivator for them to do what you want them to do. We've had laws on it for years. We all understand it. Force will motivate us to do a lot of things. The second one is fraud. And it takes on a number of angles, but the first one is kind of a recruiting tool. Think of it as bait and switch. You're offered one thing to get you to go into the relationship, but once you're in it, you get something completely different than you expected. And it always has to be that commercial sex or labor that they switch it to, okay? So we have kids who are coming to the United States who are being visited by someone living here who returns to their country of origin. They go to an impoverished family in a developing nation and say, if you allow your daughter to come live with us, I'll make certain she gets an American education, which is a tremendously attractive thing to them. And they say, here's our daughter. And they bring them over to the United States and they never enroll them in school. Instead, they keep them as a domestic servant. They do all of their house chores for them so they don't have to. And the child was brought here under fraud. I thought I was gonna get this, I wound up with this. We have people who are coming here who thought they were gonna work in a restaurant and they became a prostitute. It, it's used frequently to induce someone into the relationship and then they switch it on them once they get here. The third thing that traffickers use to accomplish this, if force is the physical motivator for you to do what I want you to do, Coercion is the psychological motivator. It's where I climb in your head and make you think there's a negative consequence if you don't do what I say. And it takes on a number of forms. If you're undocumented, your number one fear is getting deported. So they play on that. If you leave me, you'll be arrested, jailed, deported, and never have a chance to come back here. But if you stay and work for me for two years, I'll let you go and you can stay in the country. And they have given them incentive to plow through the misery for that period of time, thinking that release comes at the end. It may or it may not, but at least the traffickers delayed that conversation for a while, while they get the person's cooperation to do whatever it is they're asking them to do. So it's a really short, simple, concise definition. They use force, fraud, or coercion to exploit for either commercial, sexual activity, or labor. That's human trafficking. And if you have one plus one, you have a case. So, so we have a number of areas where we have found people in compelled service in this country. We have found them in agricultural work. 
Not all agricultural areas are trafficking, but some of them are. We found them in childcare and domestic situations. We found them in the manufacturing and garment industry. We have found them in prostitution. We've found them as street peddlers and hawkers. There was a case in New York City where they were taking 11 to 13 year old hearing impaired Mexican children and putting them on the street corner to sell a keychain. It had a tag on it that said, I love you, said I'm deaf, said it was a dollar, had a smiley face, an American flag and the sign language symbol for I love you. Man, people would buy one, two, three of those things, you know? But the child couldn't communicate that they're gonna be beaten if they don't meet a daily quota. So they're using force to exploit them for labor. And it's a human trafficking scenario. We have found them in construction, we have found them in janitorial services, hotel housekeepers included, even restaurants. These are the predominant areas where we have found people in trafficking scenarios in this country. A few years ago, when I was researching this, I was trying to figure out what resources are there to help us? What can we do? And what I noticed was there were 42 task forces operating around the country in 2006. And you had to have three things in order to get that task force. You had to have a law enforcement agency that was willing to do the investigation. You had to have a social service provider who was willing to take care of the victim while you after you found them, but while you continued the investigation. And there had to be enough of a relationship between those two that the U.S. attorney would say, I bless this union. <laughs> so I was reading about cases, I was looking at those, and I saw this, um, just trying to figure out, okay, if I came across a victim, who would I call if this is the humane way to, to help them? And I was reading about a case in Lisbon, Maine, um, law enforcement officers saw that men were coming and going at a late hour of night from the Asian Therapy Center and the Asian Acupressure Center. They set up surveillance. They never saw any women. They just saw men coming and going. They got inside. They found six Korean women who were, gonna be, who were being prostituted out of those locations. And they talked to them. They found out their story. And then they called a social service provider to care for them. Now, this, this agency, they didn't have a task force. They just did this because it was a recommended thing to do. They did it because it was a good thing to do. And I thought, you know, I wonder who I would call in our area if I needed some, if I found a victim and I needed her taken care of. So I called the National Anti-Trafficking Hotline. It's 888-3737-888. And they answered, they said, National Anti-Trafficking Hotline, do you think you've come into contact with a trafficked person? I said, no, but if I did, what would you do? And they said, can you hold please? <laughs> And a few minutes later, they came back on and said, can you repeat your question? And I said, look, I'm trying to figure out, I'm in law enforcement, I'm trying to figure out what am I gonna do if I ever find a victim and I wanna do it before I find one. And they were like, oh, okay. <laughs> so they gave me the number of a place in Chicago that oversaw eight states, including Ohio, that would, that would help us. So I called them. I said, I don't have a victim, but I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do if I ever find one. And they said, if you're within 150 miles of Chicago, we provide direct services. I said, I'm outside the radius, what will you do? And they said, we'll get you someone in Ohio who will care for that victim. I said, great, who do you have? They said, right now, nobody. So I got off the phone with them and I called Salvation Army here in Columbus. They said, can I talk to you about human trafficking? And they said, you know, we just had a class on that a few weeks ago, we'd love to talk to you about it. First people I had ever met who said, I've had a class on this. <laughs> So I rushed over and I met with three people and uh, Michelle Hannon was the, the main person I was talking with. And we talked for like an hour and a half about this. And I said, look, I'm off duty. I'm not here on behalf of my employer or anybody else. But right now in Ohio, there's no one who works with these victims. And the way the rest of the country does it, where they are looking for them, is that law enforcement hands them off to the service provider and then they continue their investigation while you take care of them. I said, now someday, sometime, someone in Columbus or the area is gonna find one of these victims. And when they do, we need someone to take them to. So no one's asking you to do it, but would you? And she said, let me go ask Major Kirk. So she goes down the hall, she comes back a few minutes later. Major, she said, Major Kirk said, bring them to us. We'll do anything you need, anything they need. And a few minutes later, he came in the room. He said, Ken, I'm glad you asked this question. He said, I've met these victims, I've seen how they live, 
and we will do anything you need and anything they need. And I said, where did you see these victims at? He said, I used to be over Salvation Army in Lisbon, Maine. I said, the Asian Therapy Center and Asian Acupressure Center? He said, you've heard of them? I said, I've heard of them. I've never been to them, but I've heard of them. I said, were you the service provider they called? He goes, yeah. Now, I want to ask you, how do you know God is with you in the details? Is it when you read about a case, you try to find someone to do what the person in the, case, in the news article did, and a thousand miles from where it happened, you find the person that did it, and they offer to help you? Follow me. Follow me. So we started there. Health and Human Services uh, had 16 coalitions they had built around the country called Rescue and Restore. None of them were in Ohio. So I started calling them for two years saying, can you put one of those in Ohio? And I was getting invitations to speak around the state. And I emailed the director of this program. And I said, here's the 11 cities in Ohio I've spoken in. Here's all the groups that have asked for a presentation and also the entities that have attended those presentations. Can you take this list and make a coalition for our state? And after two years of those calls, they said, we'll send the team out. So they sent someone here. They, we sat down and met. They were in Columbus in the area for 12 weeks visiting organizations, asking them to participate in this coalition. And today, we have 75% of our counties in Ohio covered by these Rescue and Restore coalitions. Where there used to be around 16, only 16 in the country, we have pretty close to that in Ohio now. And we have over 100 participating organizations in our Central Ohio Rescue and Restore Coalition. And it just came out of asking someone to help and I found someone who was in the story that I had read about. And everything I read early on with this said that this was an immigrant issue. It was, a, it was happening to immigrants. And there was really no discussion about it happen, happening to U.S. citizens. But eventually, we got to a place where the FBI was asked to give testimony before Congress. And the assistant director of the FBI's criminal investigative division was asked, how many children in this country are commercially sexually exploited? And his answer surprised me. He said, I don't know. Which I don't think was the answer Congress was looking for. But he said two things after that that were very interesting to me. He said, I don't know how many children in this country are commercially sexually exploited. The only things I can tell you for certain is that the numbers are up and the ages are down. The numbers are up and the ages are down. Now, if we look at that through an economic model of supply and demand, I give our caseworkers, when they come to the class, I, I, when I send them out at lunchtime, I said, I, I, you have homework. I don't know how many people give you homework when you go to lunch, but I do. And I expect 100% participation. And I tell them, I want you to prove this equation for me. Money plus demand equals supply. I said, now here's your assignment. I want you to go to a restaurant, look at the menu, tell them what you want, pay for it, and see if they bring it to you. And everyone pretty happily goes and does their homework after that. <laughs> So, if you look at it through that kind of model, money plus demand equals supply. What the FBI assistant director was saying is that the supply situation is that the numbers are up, the ages are down, they're offering a wider variety of this product. Where that happens with supply, demand must be high. What he couldn't tell us was where the demand was but in the details, you can see it. You don't have a large increasing number of victims and the age is going down where they're offering a wider variety of this without having a lot of people looking for it. They did a great thing. They put out two $1 million grants. One of those grants went to a lady that I had the privilege of meeting. Um, her name is Linda Smith. She was a congresswoman from the state of Washington. She served eight years in their state legislature, term, term limited out, and then her constituents got together and elected her to Congress through a write-in campaign. She never ran. They elected her through a write-in vote, and they sent her to Congress for two, two terms. And Linda went there. 
She's a believer. She represented her state well. Her constituents were very satisfied with her representation. And she got a call one day from a guy in India and he said, you've got to come here and see this. So she travels over to Mumbai, India, and he takes her to Faulkner Road. Now Mumbai has 20 million people in it. And he took her to Faulkner Road, the red light district, where she saw children in brothels that were as young as five years old. And when she left Congress, she started an organization to try to intervene in that. And she eventually worked internationally on it and then got involved in the United States. She got one of these million dollar grants. They gave her 10 cities here in the United States where she was supposed to go and train them on how to look for the domestic victims that Congress and the FBI were, were learning about. And she got small places like Las Vegas. Okay, look, can I say Vegas has a huge problem? <laughs> I mean, anyone who's been there knows, right? So they looked at the prostitution arrests in the juvenile courts over a three year period of time. And they found that children from 35 out of 50 states had been arrested there on charges for prostitution. And she was finding it in other areas as well. In her study, in those 10 cities, what they found was that the average age of recruitment into this was 13. Now, judge told, uh, there's a judge here in town. Um, he educated me. He said that women nationwide who enter prostitution, 62% of them enter it before the age of 18. So there's a lot of overlap. Is there an average age? I don't know. I can tell you Linda in her study said that was 13 in the areas where she was active. So we're looking at the idea of prevention work. When should we start that? And I would say at least before eighth grade based on Linda's research. We've got to make it age appropriate, but we need to do it. So the University of Pennsylvania did a study in 2000. Estes and Weiner wrote 360 pages of light reading if you'd like to look it up this weekend. And their estimate was that 289,000 children in 2000 were at risk for commercial sexual exploitation in this country. So we started trying to figure out how can we make a difference? How can we help? The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children tells us that one in six runaways in their database are likely sex trafficking victims. And they believe that in the 60 percentile of those one in six were in custody of children's services when they ran. There's an overwhelming impact on kids who are already abused previously, disconnected from their family, who are um, trying to figure out why do people keep hurting me? And they go to those kids and recruit them into this. And there's a program here in town called Catch Court. It was started in 2009 by Judge Herbert. And I've met several people in his program. And I don't know everyone in it, but all of the ones I've met used to be on children's services caseloads. So everything seemed to be falling like dominoes. And I got a call one day from an officer down at the courthouse and he said, hey, Judge Herbert wants your phone number. And my heart stopped <laughs> and he said, it's not bad. I'm like, okay. So he gave my number to him and he called and he said, hey, can I go to lunch? I keep hearing your name about this human trafficking thing and I'd like to talk to you. So he said, I started this program and I'd like to tell you about it. And I'd like for you to learn about it. Um, so we've got a video that we would like to show you for a few minutes and um, like you to learn about this program and see the type of work they're doing. But more importantly, I'd like you to notice how Judge Herbert got involved in this. I was a prostitute. It wasn't just filling trap, I was trapped. Girls get raped out there, beat up, held hostage. Overnight, you're owned by somebody. Them four years was hell. I was in this hotel for like two years straight. I mean, like, they would bring you your food, they would give you your drinks, they would give you your, your drugs. 
you gotta sleep with who they tell you to. You pray and wish that you could be done with this lifestyle. When we would sit there and talk about, hey, you know, how are we gonna get out of this? Well, you can call the police. Well, you gotta think, we're doing dates with police officers, with detectives, we're doing dates with them. I never felt safe. I never thought I could turn to them for nothing. I've had the real type of law supposed to help you and then the type of law that's used you. So it was hard to trust him. You know, an officer rolls up on you, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if he's going to force you to do something or if he's there to actually help you. It's really traumatic. Like, it's horrible. I wouldn't wish that lifestyle on nobody. Nobody. The police were bringing me search warrants on human trafficking cases. And the prosecutor started showing me all the pictures and bringing the victims up with the bright red rings around their neck from fresh choking, hair pulled out, fresh burn marks where the guy had burned a cigarette in their skin just to torture them. And as this was going on, the sheriff brought the next defendant out on the wall and I looked over and that's when I saw a woman who looked just like one of these victims. She had that same aura about her. And so I looked down at the file and saw a prostitute. And I thought, we ought to start looking at the person that we're arresting for prostitution more like she's a victim of human trafficking. Just prior to this event, I was trying to teach my daughters the book, The Purpose Driven Life. So my one little daughter, she said, hey dad, you're doing really good teaching us about this purpose in life, but what's your purpose in life? And I was like, oh man, it just got me right there. So that night I just went upstairs and said a quick prayer. I said, you know, I know I've got this really interesting job. So I said, if there's any way you could show me how to be significant in my work, I'd appreciate that. Then things started to happen very rapidly. I started researching and I found some amazing truths that totally blew my mind away. 1,500 women charged with prostitution a year coming through Columbus. Women who are involved in prostitution re-offend 80% of the time. So that's the revolving door syndrome. The average age of the first sexual abuse is eight years old. 96% of them are runaways before they become involved in prostitution. 62% of all women enter prostitution before they're 18 years old. They couldn't believe that people were taking advantage of our women and girls and other vulnerable people in Columbus in such a horrible way. So we started a court in 2009 to allow them to exit this deadly and lifestyle. Okay, Ashley, way to go. Um, this is Changing Actions Change Habits certified. So Ashley Martin is graduating in phase two of the textbook of third May 10th. CATCH stands for Changing Actions to Change Habits because we ask women to change everything about their lives. CATCH Court is a two-year intensive probation. They have individual counseling as well as group sessions. That's kind of hard for me. Okay, I know how you feel, but you know how you can bury it. I spent most of my time surrounded by other women, even though I have my own home. It's like a legit community. It's amazing. These women have multiple complex trauma. That's at the core of their issue. And when you know how to engage them with trauma-informed approach, they will respond. So instead of saying, what's wrong with you, I learned to say, I wonder what happened to you. All right, Tina. Hi, how many days do you have? Wow, clean up. All right, so where are you at with that GED? I had your fractions. Oh my God, are you The statistics me? that we're now able to share that if you spend six months or more in the program, 62% of these women never get arrested again. And if you graduate from the program, it's a high 90 percentile, never get arrested again. I think you can say it saves money. It saves police time, it saves court time. But for me, that's not where I consider the success. When I see multi-generational healing from parents to children and the women getting their children back and how important that is to those children, uh, that's what makes it worth it to me. If it wasn't for Cat's Court, I would be back out on the street. It saved my life. They gave me my life back. They gave me a second chance. I have a home that I can actually call mine. I have, I have a one-year-old daughter. 
I got custody of my 14-year-old twins back. My grandbabies and my kids. To be a part of their lives again, it's a wonderful. I could be a good example for my kids, and my daughter would never see me the way my sons did. I may not have been a good mom, but I'm one heck of a grandma. This has been the best thing that's happened in my career and maybe my life. And now I can look my daughter in the eye and say, hey, now we know what dad's purpose was, don't we? So you saw two women in this video who were talking about, I was trying to figure out how I could get out. How can I get away from this? And who can they trust? Who can they ask? Who can they go to? Who is trustworthy, won't hurt them, and will help them get out? And can they really do it? I meet a lot of people um, through a variety of means in the community who, have, who are likely being exploited at the time that I talk to them. And I try to just sit down with them and, and say, I'm pretty certain I know what's going on. And I, I know people who have been through this and everybody gets tired of it. And there's usually not just one, there's usually several and they're all getting tired of it. And they're trying to figure out who can help me get out. How can I get away from this? And some of them have even resorted to prayer. God, can you help me get away from this? And I don't know where you are today, if you're tired of it yet, but if you are, we wanna help you. We'd like a chance to keep you safe. We'd like a chance to protect you. If you're not tired today, but it's tomorrow, we'll help you then. If it's next week, next month, whenever it is, whenever you get tired of this, we wanna help you get out. The only thing I need to know is, do you want our help today? And then I pause. And it's usually about a 15 second wait where they're thinking it over, trying to decide, can I trust this person? Can they really help? Are they capable? Are they sincere? They're weighing that option. And they're looking for people that they can believe in, who are looking to help, looking to, to intervene, who can help them get out of that because they see no way out. And I had a, the privilege of meeting a guy named Gary Haugen a few years ago. Um, one of our pastors at my church uh, went to Moody Bible Institute to a pastor's conference. And there was a guy there named Gary Haugen who was speaking on human trafficking. And the guy bought me a tape and I listened to it several times. Uh, Gary talked a lot about Psalm 10, verses 17 and 18. Which says, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. Those people who are trapped, who are saying, God, how do I get out of this? You will strengthen their hearts. You will listen carefully, doing justice for the fatherless and the oppressed, so that men of the earth may terrify them no more. And God pulls people together. Linda Smith, me, Judge Herbert, other people around the country who are getting involved and looking to make a difference in the lives of these individuals. I was speaking at an event in Akron. I got done with it. I started out of the room. Uh, there was another speaker who was coming on after me, so I didn't expect, it, I, I didn't expect anyone to talk to me. I expect them to stay there and, and uh, listen to the next one. And as I got out the door and was getting ready to start toward the elevator, I heard, hey, Ken. And I turned around, and it was a man and a woman, and they came up and they said, where do you go to church? <laughs> and I said, is it that obvious? They go, yeah, it is. They said, we meet people all over the country. And a lot of them are people of faith. It just shows, and we know that God is pulling people into this, looking to make a difference because this has been hidden in darkness for so long. And I said, what do you guys do? And they said, we're both FBI agents. <laughs> and 
And we had a great discussion talking about the things they had seen, the things I had seen, where people are just answering that simple phrase, follow me, follow me. I want you to get involved in this. I want you to make a difference. I want to take you places where you can become active in helping other people get out of an area that I believe just frustrates the heart of God. That it occurs, that it perpetuates, and that there are very few people through the years who seem to be stepping into this space. But I believe he wants to stop it. I believe he wants to close it down. And so we're trying to figure out, is that me? What's my role? How do I get involved in this? Does this impact me? Because I don't see a place for me. You know, Romans 8, 29 says that God is conforming us to the image of his son. That's his plan. Now, in that, God is making us more like Christ. And there are things that he shares with us and things that he does not. Okay, he has three characteristics none of us are ever going to have. None of us will ever be omnipresent. No matter how much, gain I, how much weight I gain, I will never be omnipresent. Okay, I will never be omnipotent. No matter how much I think I know, I'll never be omniscient. Okay, I'll never have all the strength in the world. Those are things God will not share with us. He doesn't transfer those attributes of his. But there are others that he does. And one of those is justice. One of those is justice. And I learned this from Gary Haugen as well. He was the one who pointed it out to me through his teachings. If you're being conformed to the image of Christ, you should be developing a strong sense of justice. Wanting to step in and make sure that things are flowing well. That people are experiencing justice in the world. And where we see it um, not occurring should offend our sensibilities, especially the more that I become like Christ. Now, there are people who believe they experience injustice, but it's not. So we need to be discerning about it. But God is building a sense of justice in us where we let him transform us and conform us in that area. So my question is, how's your transformation going? When you look at the world, when you hear about this happening in your community, what's it do to your heart? Do you feel God tugging, saying this is an area? Do you have something in your mind where you're saying, you know what, this looks too big, but I just keep thinking this might be a place for me to get involved. I'm asking, how's your transformation going? I'd encourage you, learn more about this topic. I think we're gonna have a Q&A after church. Um, we're gonna have some other things going on this weekend. Talk to people. If you're watching this online, talk to people who came on Sunday and ask them more about it. Educate yourself, get more information on it. Learn about who's active on this in the community and consider, are there ways that you can get involved? Not only individually, but congregationally. There may be ways that God wants to direct you to follow him.